Hi, I'm Jan, and so I'm from uh, Kivik.com, which is a company based in Czech Republic. And I came to Scylla Summit to talk about how we use and abuse Scylla to, to get the most out of it. I'm going to talk about how we, uh, how we looked under, underneath the skirt of Scylla and uh, abused SS tables and how we built uh, like our own mirror of, of all the data that we actually store in, in Cassandra and, and Scylla. And uh, why is terrible, and uh, how is Scylla helping out to remove this this burden of of maintaining a mirror of of, of our database? I'm I study mathematics, and uh, then I turn to the dark side to do informatics. And so I've been working in the travel industry for the past five years now, and currently I'm I'm in Kiwi. Um, Right. So I think that uh, Martin covered a little about what Kiwi does, but in you can you can say it in many fancy words what we do. But in reality, we we sell flight tickets, and uh, we provide users with a very powerful search engine that's able to uh, provide users with optimal routing throughout the graph of flights, which is fairly complicated. If you ever flew, and uh, I guess you, you know that uh, the prices can be quite crazy and can change very quickly. Um, so we have this website, and uh, we allow users to search, for example, from San Francisco to whatever, to Europe, if you like, and then you can specify that you would like to depart within, say, July, and would like to stay in Europe for 10, 20 days. It will just sort out everything for you and give you the fastest or cheapest or best flights possible. So that's what we do. And so actually to be able to, to do this, we need to uh, store a lot of data on site. That's uh, different compared to other meta searches that are out there. Um, there are 100,000 flights per day, which makes up to 30, 36 million flights per year, which is quite a lot of flights and quite a lot of data, right? No, it's not. Your phone can store it. That's not a lot of data. Uh, the reality, in fact, is a bit more complicated because um, airlines tend to price combinations of flight differently. And when you combine, for example, flight from Vienna to Munich with flight from Munich to San Francisco, you get much better price compared to when you would buy it separately. So we have to even store those combinations of flights with their pricing, uh, which makes up currently to 7 billion of flight entries. And currently our workload is, uh, we, generate, we generate is uh, 350,000 uh, rides per second and 600 reads per second. And we store 20 terabytes of data in multiple replicas. And you cannot store that on your phone. So we need, we need something better. Um, we grew quite quickly over the past five years from zero to turnover of, I believe, one billion dollars per year. And uh, when you have r such rapid growth as, as we have, uh, there are obviously, you know, there's some progression and uh, change of needs in your, in your data requirements. So we started with Postgres, and that's, you know, that's obvious, obvious choice. And then when the Postgres started to not catch up, we, all well, the guys who were at the time of the company started thinking how we can solve this, how we can scale the Postgres up. And they have had an idea. And uh, they invented custom sharing over Postgres and just maintained 60 Postgres, which looked like this. And then they realized that they are reading a lot from the Postgres and that uh, the Postgres is unable to keep up. So they did this. But, Another six terrace is in front of the Postgres, which is absolute joy to maintain, as you can imagine. Uh, and this is a bit of a nightmare. But then, eventually, we, we needed to scale even further. Uh, and actually, that was the time when I joined the company. And it wasn't after, until three months into the company when I just, I, I worked with the structure, and then I, I just stopped and marveled at it. Like, it was like, this makes money. Wow. <laughs> 
All right, but then, fun aside, and we uh, moved, moved to Cassandra, which was pretty much end of dark ages, uh, like, you know, compared to that. Uh, it was distributed, it was sort of scalable, and it finally allowed us to have a higher availability than the, you know, Postgres nightmare. And it allowed us to scale much, much further and to store actually much, much more data. We, from, we grew like 10 times from the Postgres to, to the Cassandra. We, the data domain grew 10 times or even more. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, but as it happens, uh, the Cassandra started to fail and started to not, not, not keep up with the data load we were putting in it. So we started investigating where we could uh, use Stella. Uh, we are currently migrating to Scylla. Uh, we, have, we had a bit problems with that because you know, we are the disk breakers. Uh, some of you may have heard of our issues with GCP and etc. Um, but Scylla anyways is going to allow us to ditch quite a lot of workarounds that we had to implement around uh, Cassandra and about which I'm going to talk about a little. And some of that Martin already covered, but uh, I'm going to just point out some, some fun facts. So in our case, the, the usage of, of Scylla and Cassandra is quite really intensive. We generate 600 reads per second. And a lot of the, those reads can be cached, like well, really a lot of them. And uh, Cassandra currently made, I, I don't know why they made this decision, but they decided that it would be a great idea to mostly rely on the system cache, which is, I don't know, it's a bit weird. But uh, the, the problem is that it really is, is slow when, 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 you, when it comes to reads and like random reads that can be actually cached. So our solution like to overcome this, this problem was, guess what? Racist, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 it sort of works most of the times. Uh, but really, it, it's not a great solution and we would like to teach that. So, and actually, so far, it seems that we will be able to do it with, uh, with Scylla. Uh, we did some benchmarking on our data load, and uh, as you can see, we were able to generate uh, on the same servers, on the same uh, data, uh, data traffic there. We were able to get one close, something close to 1 million reads from Scylla and only 40,000 reads from, from Cassandra. And that, that's not a mistake. Like, we, we tried very hard to optimize Cassandra. And it's just, you know, it's not, not good. So yeah, that's, that's some fun fact. Uh, now to the thing that we actually, that's kind of strange we have to do with our database. Um, in our use case, uh, we have something we call pre-competition engine, which is on this slide presented, represented by the cookie monster. And um, it has to, we have to feed the cookie monster every, every hour or so with fresh data. Because the pricing uh, of airlines, it changes rapidly. Like it, it really, it can change from, from minute to minute. So we need to keep the computation engine computing like very quickly. Plus we have secondary staging production and we do a lot of testing. So like we need to download a lot of data into multiple of these cookie monsters. And uh, that would be, if, if we do it directly, then it, it would probably present uh, like quite heavy load on the on the database, like to dumping those 20 terabytes of data every every hour or so. So <clears throat> in the stages one and two, when we use Postgres, it sort of worked because it was crap anyway, and no one noticed that we overloaded it. And uh, uh, when we started using Cassandra and wanted to do the same thing to just dump the data. Uh, we already had much, much more data, and uh, it just we tried to do full table scans with token ranges, etc. Tried to be very clever how we read the data, but it just it just did this like massive load spikes of 140 over you know, on on servers that had only 36 cores, which was uh, inconvenient, um, and it sort of failed like. Our theory was because well, we blame it on Java, and uh, also we are rereading the data like all the time. Like the some of the data, some portion of the data doesn't change too much, so we are rereading it. And then we thought about that we could use some, we could in, insert a, like last update timestamp, and then just 
uh, like to the query at uh, Criterion that like check only select only the data that were changed. But that's still you still have to go through data, and uh, Cassandra wasn't very good about it and wasn't very happy about it. So we were sort of stuck. But then uh, we fought a little, and so we thought that like there are uh, Cassandra is constantly streaming the data from mem tables to SS tables, which is very convenient for us because there are only the fresh data are you know appending and. Uh, SS tables are immutable, which is also great. So we started thinking, and we had an idea. We can create a service that can detect and parse all the newly created SS tables. We'll call this service a splitter. Then we can stream all the data that our customer is producing into the SS tables to something we call mergers, which is our custom data cache. And uh, we can then feed our pre-processing engine from the data cache which sounds a little crazy, and uh, I will tell you why exactly. But uh, this way, we will not overload the database every time we need to reload data to the cookie monster. And uh, in case the splitters are able to read the SS tables efficiently, it will basically mean zero load on the, on the Cassandra. So we're feeling confident. This is how it was supposed to look like. You can see that we, are, we wanted to deploy the splitter on each Cassandra node, then like stream it somehow to the measures, and then have multiple preprocessing engines just getting data from measures. That was the idea. Um, in case of splitters, uh, we had to we had to reverse engineer the SS table format sort of because there is some documentation, but but we had to really understand how actually Cassandra stores the SS tables and what are the guarantees, which is obviously not very well documented because. You know, it's not public API really to uh, scan as tables. Then we implemented a fast as table in Parser in uh, C++. Actually, first it was in Haskell, but just as a prototype, you know, for fun. And then we moved to C++. And then uh, it's just quite easy. You implement a mechanism for detection of as tables, and then uh, you stream all the data, including the last update timestamp. Right, then you have mergers, which are the nodes that uh, actually aggregate the data. And we used, like, again, we couldn't put uh, all the data on one node, so we had to, like, shard it somehow over multiple nodes. So we used some logical key that is present in our data to actually shard it. And uh, we went for like only, we didn't care too much about replication or high availability. If it crashes, we just reload the data. Like it is not very important for us whether it crashes or not. Like if it crashes, it's bad, but not a big deal. So, but uh, in, the cache, uh, in the case that something crashes and you lose the data from one node, you have to actually reread all the SS tables because you have no idea what you lost, which is inconvenient, but it's all right, it works. There are some problems. Um, for example, it's not very well defined uh, how long it takes for Cassandra to flush the data from mem table to SS tables. It's it's sort is defined-ish, but but it can really depend on the workload, etc. And uh, with the eventual consistency, you don't really have a guarantee that if you deploy the splitters on on one uh, into one data center you really get all the data because you know it's only eventually consistent. So you have to deploy the splitters on all the disk, on all the Cassandra nodes, which is in our case uh, three times more load. And then you have to parse all the data, even though it's most of the times you get you know the data from free replicas, so it's it's duplicated. Um, yeah, and our problem, the obvious problem, is that we are depending on some weird not public format that is internal to, to, to Cassandra. That, that's not very cool. You know, zero support, no guarantees, no documentation. It's, it's insane, really. And also, obviously, we had to put some development into this to actually make it work. Um, right. Yeah. But the good things are that it actually allows us to do very frequent full data dumps and to maintain this uh, representation of our data in a very convenient way that, is, uh, that allows us to 
load the data very fast and actually do some pre-processing on it before we actually load the data. And uh, during normal operation, there are like really the splitters do almost nothing because it's fairly optimized. They just read this one split, one SS table at a time, and it's it's there's zero impact on production DB, which is very cool. It's quite isolated. Um, and what's still a change about this about this you know crazy master plan is that. Um, is that we don't really anymore, we don't, we would like to obviously, we would like to ditch the idea of scanning access tables. And with Scylla, we actually can do that. We can do full table scans on token ranges and filter, filter for uh, with, with this timestamp. And uh, it actually works, and Scylla can handle that, which is amazing as compared to Cassandra. So we can ditch most of, of that crazy things. Um, it doesn't overload when we do that. And uh, yeah, we are planning on deleting the SS table parser. And then we can either maybe keep the splitters and uh, like parse only local, uh, local data from each node. And uh, then, because you know, when we, we do the, our custom sharding, you have really no guarantee of, of on which node is going to end up the data. So it's, it's better if you, if you, if you can like, stream it directly. But if you are lazy, we are just, we're just going to just request the data directly from mergers, and it's going to be fine. And with this approach, like most of the problems are going to disappear. Uh, we won't have the problem with, with um, a table to a stable latency, which is terrible and very, I'm not very comfortable about having some undefined latency in our like, data process. Um, we are going to keep the probably are going to keep our, our mirror data because it's very convenient and uh, currently still I can do the pre-processing we are doing with the data. It's very compute intensive. But uh, we won't anymore be depending on, our, on that internal format and uh, we will delete a lot of our code base, which would be great. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs>